Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Kirgolan Forum. And now we'll proceed to panel discussion three, responses to the impact of Russia-Ukraine war on the Indo-Pacific order. And there are five panelists in this session, respectively, from United States, Japan, Australia, UK, and India. And please welcome our moderator of panel discussion, former Minister for Defense Australia, Christopher Pine. Well, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. I've dispensed with my mask because, uh, as you can see, I'm the only person on the stage, which many people would find intimidating, of course, but for those people who know me, it's of no consequence to me whatsoever. I'm very happy to be the only person on the stage. Uh, it's great to be here at the Katagalan Forum again. Uh, in some ways, you could say I'm a Katagalan Forum alumnus because I spoke here uh, in a keynote speech in 2019 uh, when the world was a very different place. Uh, and not long after, I had retired from the House of Representatives after 26 years. And uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I was a Cabinet Minister in the Abbott, Morrison and Turnbull governments finishing as the Minister for Defence. And uh, a long time ago, I was a minister in the Howard government. So I managed to survive four Australian prime ministers, which is an achievement all of its own. And I'm very pleased to be here. I've been to Taiwan. This is my second visit. I'm delighted to be on such a distinguished panel uh, with some tremendously good contributors. And I'm glad to see that uh, despite it's the, it's the hellish straight after lunch session, uh, almost everybody has come back into the room. So, Mr. President, uh, you've done very well. To you and Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much for the invitation again this year, and I look forward to further invitations. On our uh, panel this afternoon to discuss the subject of responses to the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war on the Indo-Pacific order, I would stress that the subject is about responses, not necessarily about lessons learned. And they are two quite different things. Uh, responses is not so much about analysing the war, but so much how we're going to respond to it to, to ensure that there are practical outcomes from what is obviously an illegal and hideous action on the part of uh, the Putin regime. I'm joined by Jim Mattis, for those of you who don't know, of course, Jim Mattis was the Secretary of Defence in the Trump administration. He, at the moment, he's the Davies Family Distinguished Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He was a distinguished commander in the US uh, Marines uh, over 43 years and was the commander of the US Central Command, which covered the Middle East and over 200,000 soldiers. He and I also uh, served together uh, he was the Minister for the Secretary of Defence, I was the Minister for Defence Industry and then the Minister for Defence, and we have much in common. Of course, not the military service, but our view about uh, the place of the West in the current world. We're also joined by His Excellency Nakayama Yasuhida. At the moment, uh, Yasuhida-san is the Special Advisor for Foreign Affairs to the LDP chairperson of the Foreign of the Policy Research Council, uh, and he's also the chair of the House of Representatives Committee on Foreign Affairs in the Japanese Diet. Uh, Dr. Robin Niblett, who is the director and chief executive of Chatham House in UK. Uh, he was also, from 2001, 2006, the executive vice president of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., uh, and as a distinguished member of the panel. And, of course, from my own country, uh, Rory Medcalf. Uh, Rory Medcalf is the head of college at the National Security College at the Australian National University in Australia, probably our most preeminent university, certainly internationally, and our preeminent research university. He's also been a distinguished Australian diplomat serving around the world in Japan and in New Delhi, and uh, he played a hand in drafting the 2016 uh, Defence White Paper in the Turnbull government, which I then went on to 
implement as a minister, and Jayadeva Ranade, who is the president of the Center for China Analysis and Strategy in India. He's currently also a member of the National Security Advisory Board in India and has served diplomatically in places like Hong Kong, Beijing, and was the, finally the minister, the Indian minister in the embassy in Washington, DC. So without any further ado, I can see they're all in position and I would uh, love to hand over the opportunity to Jim Mattis, whom I hold in very high regard, to give us uh, his contribution on this subject of responses to the Russia-Ukraine war. Well, thank you and thank all of you for inviting me to attend here. It's an absolute delight to be engaged uh, with any democracy today. And I think the most immediate impact of what has happened with this tragedy unfolding in Ukraine is that we're seeing a gathering of wits among the democracies, and not just the democracies, any nation that values sovereignty has gotten a rather sobering lesson here. And so what we're seeing is a gathering of like-minded, but it's not only the democracies. Uh, it's also, for example, just weeks before the Russian invasion, uh, President Xi and President Putin spoke about a teamwork without limits, a partnership without limits. And I bring this up because by President Xi's words and by President Putin's words, they have co-joined the Transland European Theater with the Indo-Pacific Theater. By the statement of what they have put together, they have made very clear where they stand. I believe, however, that uh, President Xi had been shocked at several things here to include Russian military's pathetic performance, uh, certainly the amount of death and destruction. Uh, here you have Russia with a long land border with the Ukraine uh, and apparently thinking it was going to be a cakewalk and now they're finding the Chinese are watching this unfold weeks after they've uh, announced a partnership without limits, and it's anything but that. And then when you look at this against the unity of the West, the diplomatic unity, the economic unity, the military response by NATO, uh, what you're seeing is an impact that is global. It is not simply uh, confined to the European region. This is now seen for what it is. And I think the Japanese prime minister made it very clear in his May statement. He summed up, uh, I think he gave the sum of our concerns when he said Ukraine might be East Asia tomorrow. Uh, and when we look at what is happening in the South China Sea, when we look at the line of actual control uh, in Northern India, uh, Suddenly, the alignment between Russia and China and their apparent authoritarian response is one that we should be equally concerned with. Um, it's, uh, it's something that we do, I'm sure we'll get into more detail here uh, as we go through our discussion, uh, Minister Pine, but I, I believe that what we have to look at is that uh, right now, this is not going to influence directly uh, what uh, President Xi has in mind as far as taking Taiwan by force. I think it will impact him severely about how and when to take such a step. But I think right now we have to look at this as far as our response uh, in three words. Allies, allies, allies. We are stronger if we want to deter war, if we speak as one voice and say sovereignty must be respected. So far, it's holding. So far, there's a lot of indications that the, uh, that the uh, diplom diplomacy is holding together. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's a lot of uh, answers that we're going to have to come up with as we face the uncertainty of a chilly winter in Europe, of an increasingly uh, bellicose 
uh, Russia and a China that continues to amplify uh, the Russian uh, reasons for this invasion of a country that could not have been uh, displayed as a threat. Uh, and that is proven by the deployment of the Russian troops. They were never in defensive positions. They were put into assembly areas for offensive operations. It is very clear the Russian military had no fear of an attack by Ukraine, no matter what lies come out of uh, Moscow. So let me stop there. Krista, you can go around the horn. Good to see you again, my old friend, and back over to you. Thank you very much, Secretary Mattis, since we're being so formal. And uh, uh, we now ask uh, on Nakayama Yasuhida whether he would like to make a contribution on this subject of the war in Ukraine and its lessons and responses here in the Indo-Pacific. Oh, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Yasuhiro Natayama. I am a former State Minister of Defense of the Ministry of, Jap Ministry of Defense of Japan. Uh, I said uh, good morning because I'm now in Israel. I'm now at the uh, Tel Aviv University, inside of the university. So uh, I'm sorry to uh, uh, a little bit far away. Uh, from Taiwan, but uh, I love Taiwan always. So, hello everyone. This is Yasuhida Nakayama. Thank you for uh, inviting us, uh, inviting us to the Katagiran Forum 2022, hosted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Government of Taiwan today. Uh, actually, another Japanese politician was scheduled to participate here, but unfortunately, his attendance was no longer possible. It is my senior politician who loves Taiwan and is the most trusted Japanese politician, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, and the former president of the Liberal Democratic Party. Very sad, regrettable, painful, and disappointing. Condolences from President, Madam President Tsai Ing-wen. We would like to express our sincere gratitude to Vice President Lai Setok Sensei for coming to Tokyo on behalf of Taiwanese who love democracy. As you know from the press at 11.31 on July 8th, Friday, 2022, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was assassinated in Nara City, killing his precious life. I rushed the hospital in Nara Prefecture, where he was urgently transported and spent the night at the hospital on the night of the day when Prime Minister Abe was killed by bullets. I still feel unbelievable that Prime Minister Abe will call my cell phone as usual. I wonder how much Prime Minister Abe was looking forward to seeing Madam President Tsai Ing-wen and all the other people here. It breaks my heart to think of it. In a democratic nation, where freedom of thought and belief uh, is allowed, unlike in, unlike in autocracy, uh, uh, unlike in autocracy, you can argue freely. Nevertheless, we cannot forgive the act of violence against a politician who loves democracy and kills one politician. People all over the world will be paying attention to the background of this assassination, and the real background is going to become truth of the affair to light. We are here to meet for one important purpose. What is it? It is about sharing and making friends about the value of democracy. The present of the 21st century, people around the world are involved in the supply chain dis dis disruption caused by the corona pandemic, followed by Russia's military invasion of Ukraine following the corona pandemic. Food, fuel, etc., are soaring and have a great impact on our lives and life. The world is expected to become polarized in the future. One is a democratic politi policy, po polit one is a democratic politics group and the other is an autocrat group. And I think each of them will build and rebuild its supply chain. 
What should we learn from the situation in Ukraine in this time? It is important to replace the situation in Ukraine with our region of Asia. Number one. One is that it is ourselves who protect our beloved homeland. Second, recognition that three countries around North Korea, Russia, and China are actually nuclear armed. Number three, if the permanent members of the United Nations and the security members are, per and are parties to the war, the United Nations will be incapable incapacitated. In other words, United Nations reform is indispensable. Number four, allies are required. In other words, making friends is very important. For example, Russia has not attacked three Baltic states, which are NATO member countries and belong to the EU. That is why Finland and Sweden also want to join NATO. It is important for NATO to implement mutual defense with the United States of America and Japan with the United States of America. In 2015, Japan enacted the right of collective self-defense. At that time, the Japanese opposition criticized, will Japan be involved in the war? But which is right, the Abe administration or opposition? Needless to say, the Abe cabinet's way of thinking is correct. For example, will the United States and other countries protect us if we are invaded by foreign countries? Protect your own country. That is the basis. No one can help without the effort. In Ukraine, the Ukrainian people are desperately defending their homeland. That is why supporting countries emerge from all over the world, right, collect, right of collective self-defense. The United States launches aircraft carriers and aircraft the Japanese self-defense forces protect it. The Abe administration has pushed this policy forward. As a result, the approval rating for the Abe administration fell by 10% at that time. I heard from Mr. Abe directly that President Trump said, Shinzo, you great. Prime Minister Abe and President Trump weren't just enjoying gold. The new U.S.-Japan relationship between U.S. President Joe Biden and the current Prime Minister Kishida has announced that Japan's defense capabilities will be drastically strengthened. Given that NATO countries' defense spending is 2% of GDP, Japan will also increase its defense spending to 2% over the next five years. However, there is no point, no point in simply increasing the amount, the amount. It is necessary to enhance and strengthen the basic structure of defense, mainly the game changer area, in the form of defense in preparation for hybrid warfare. In addition, considering the issue of population decline and security, it is one of the important issues to utilize game-changer technology and reduce the labor of soldiers in defense. We believe that we should work harder in the areas of space, cyber, and electric magnetic warfare, and still carry out production domestically or collaborate with democratic teams. For example, the state-of-the-art stealth fighter F-35, owned by the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force, is made by Lockheed Martin of the United States. But the wings of the aircraft, the helmet of the pilot, the instrument panel of the cockpit, the fuel tank, etc., are all made in Israel. In 2020, 41% of the world's cybersecurity investment will be invested in Israel. Without the cybersecurity, neither defense nor private citizens can be protected. With that in mind, it is important for the restructuring of the supply chain to carefully consider the state of technology from upstream to downstream and to build and produce it while ensuring safety and security. 
many fellow countries, many fellow countries such as North, Korea, North America and Europe dispatched ships to the East China Sea and South China Sea. They are to protect freedom of navigation in the free ocean. 90% of crude oil and 60% of natural gas imported into Japan pass through the basis, uh, pass, to, pass through the Basi Strait. In, in, the, in the unlikely event that an emergency occurs around Taiwan, it is not another person's affair. Japan's Yonaguni Island, which is the closest, closest to Taiwan, is only 110 kilometers away. From, from a geopolitical point of view, Taiwan and Japan are faithful communities. The Japanese themselves should be deeply, de deeply aware that a Taiwan emergency is a Japanese emergency. I think the bad leaders of autocrats are trying to reach out to their tentacles by taking advantage of the peace bokeh, means uh, peace dummy, uh, lessons that prevail in democracies. Impact work on it is very easy to carry out in the age of the internet. Let's share the value of democracy with Asian countries and cooperate with the democratic nations of the world as a team so as not to give them such a chance. One year ago, in an interview with Hudson Institute, Dr. Kenneth Weinstein asked me, is Taiwan a Japanese friend? Well, I said, Taiwan is not a friend. Taiwan is uh, my brother, my sister. I am a family member of Taiwan. Japan and Taiwan is a family, one family. I still feel that way. How should the fact that countries such as Japan broke diplomatic relations with Taiwan, which is liberal and democratic, about 50 years ago, be politically verified in the current situation. We also need a solid political and strategic debate on future direction. For the free and open Indo-Pacific initiative, it is very important to establish security, not only in the security environment around Taiwan, but also in all regions of the Indo-Pacific. As comrade of democracy, I'd like to actively challenge the team, teams of democracies to increase their peers and maintain peace with a sense of tension. Thank you for listening. Arigatou gozaimashita. Todaraba. Thank you. Thank you, Yasahidi, for that very uh, uh, passionate uh, defense of... Uh, the Taiwan-Japan relationship, but also your very heartfelt words about former Prime Minister Abe. And I'm sure uh, all of the condolences from Taiwan, from the Prospect Foundation, from this forum, my own personal condolences go to you and, of course, the Japanese people for what is a hideous crime. As I'm sure you're aware, Shinzo Abe was a very good friend to Australia and of Australia and of the particular Prime Ministers with whom he served. And the Australian people are completely shocked by his terrible death. And we look forward to hearing more from both you and Jim uh, during question and answer session. If I could now go to Dr. Robin Niblett, who's the Director and Chief Executive of Chatham House in the UK. And uh, Dr. Niblett, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. Thank you for the kind welcome. Um, let me add. Uh, your words uh, and say my words to Nakayama san about the tragic passing uh, and assassination of uh, Prime Minister Abe. Um, it was a very important point to raise here, so uh, thank you for, for raising that, and I add my, my words uh, to yours. And thank you for this opportunity to participate in the forum. Um, the timing is, uh, is important, to put it mildly. Um, and I think, as Jim Mattis uh, indicated a minute ago, um, we are um, at a particularly... Uh, critical moment in international affairs uh, and one where this forum is all the more important. I just want to follow, maybe in British style, slightly some of the key questions you asked us here and these, the linkages between um, uh, Russia's 
uh, threats to Europe and China's threats in the Indo-Pacific. Just to say a few opening comments. First of all, um, on the analogies between the two, uh, it is quite clear that both Russia and China uh, reject the international order in their regions. Um, from uh, Vladimir Putin's standpoint, the president of Russia, uh, he has unfinished business uh, from the end of the Cold War. He's been increasingly explicit about it, that he wants to rebuild a greater Russia, a Ruski Mir, Russia world, uh, out of the rubble of the collapse of the Soviet Union at, at the end of the Cold War. And uh, while uh, Russia lost control over Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, other parts um, of the broader USSR, the former uh, Soviet Union, what has been most painful, painful is the loss of those uh, uh, now countries, independent states closest to its border, more to its uh, west, the Baltic states in particular, obviously Georgia, Belarus, which is now being brought a bit more into Russia's orbit, and most importantly, uh, Ukraine. Um, similarly, it strikes me in terms of parallels, uh, China believes it has lost core parts of historical China, the People's Republic of China, the Communist Party, uh, believes that it needs to recover the totality um, of that China, having done so with Tibet, you could argue now fully with Hong Kong. Taiwan stands out in a way to their standpoint um, as unfinished business as well. And I think uh, for both countries, um, in some ways uh, worse than not being able to control, uh, let's say Ukraine in Russia's case, Taiwan in Beijing's case, um, is the fact that uh, certainly Ukraine was heading towards a divorce, a formal divorce uh, from Russia, where the capacity to integrate those two countries again was close to being totally lost. Uh, and clearly there's a deep concern in Beijing that the separation with Taiwan is going to become permanent de facto, if not de jure. Um, and uh, the fear, of course, is that this is something that diminishes them, both in Beijing uh, and in Moscow, economically. Um, uh, and in Russia's case, think about population, uh, with a 45 million or so population in Ukraine versus 130, 140 million in Russia, and a, and a depopulating and aging Russia, losing Ukraine uh, permanently is a real blow to its status uh, as a great power. Um, uh, but in both cases, both for Beijing and for Moscow, it diminishes the credibility of their leadership, their political leadership. Uh, I'd say in particular in Beijing's case, where the uh, Chinese Communist Party's uh, legitimacy stands really at the core and its capacity to restore Chinese sovereignty over its entire territory. Um, so they both feel, uh, I'd say, that they have unfinished business and, as I said, are not status quo powers. Um, the additional part to put in here, and I think Jim Mattis, uh, General Mattis was alluding to this, is that they see, uh, in Beijing's case, Taiwan, and in Moscow's case, uh, Ukraine, as part of a global power struggle in which the US in particular, with its allies, um, is an agent of this separation, is actually trying to use Ukraine and Russia's case, um, and obviously uh, uh, Taiwan and Beijing's case, to undermine them, to actually weaken them uh, in the context of a greater global power struggle. Uh, as we know, Moscow was deeply concerned about NATO expansion, although I don't think that was the primary reason for its invasion. And we've heard uh, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, make the point that uh, the US is trying to introduce an Indo-Pacific NATO through its various uh, steps, uh, which I'll come to uh, in a minute. But therefore, um, and I think this points to the very important element that uh, Jim Mattis brought into the conversation, there is a growing China-Russia alignment, uh, which is changing the face um, of uh, global politics and global geopolitics. Even though I suspect uh, Beijing would prefer not to be as aligned uh, as it is currently to Russia, it has uh, made that choice uh, and I think its positioning on the uh, illegal invasion of Ukraine uh, particularly stands out, and there's no going back uh, to that alignment. Um, I think we've noted here that both sides have tried uh, uh, the economic route to try to sustain uh, that dependence um, of what they see as their satellite states on, on the mother country. Russia tried that uh, for 10, 20 years after Ukrainian independence at the end of the Cold War, principally through its energy interconnections, but it is striking 
that uh, even 10 years ago, uh, Ukraine used to export 25% of its exports, a bit over, to Russia. Now it's down to 8%. It has moved the bulk of its exports to the EU, over 43% in 2021. So there'd been a complete strategic turn of Ukraine's uh, perspective uh, towards uh, the EU, including with the uh, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement that they struck with the EU. And of course, a growing uh, uh, relationship at the security level with NATO, in many cases bilateral, but with at least a promise in the long term uh, of NATO membership. China's relationship, and I'm, I look at this from the outside, I don't bring the expertise to the Indo-Pacific that many other speakers on this panel do, but as I look at it, obviously, uh, it's quite striking to me that Taiwan continues to export roughly 43% of its exports to China. Um, so there is a, quite an important differentiator there between Ukraine's position and China's. And you might analyze from that that whereas Russia felt it hit a moment of no return, either Vladimir Putin acted now or he would forever lose the opportunity to uh, reintegrate um, uh, Ukraine into his view of a greater Russia. It strikes me that China, Beijing, for its part, thinks it has more time to play with. I don't know how much time, um, and we can come to that maybe later in the panel, but it does strike me that there is a different dynamic at play between the two. Just very quickly, two last comments. One about whether, sitting as I am in London, but uh, as a student more of European politics, um, how meaningful is European commitment both to security and the international order in Europe, but also in, a, in the Indo-Pacific. I would just make two couple of comments. I could spend a long time talking about European politics. It is a good thing, number one, that we do not have the populist parties in power currently and did not have European populist parties in power at the moment of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So whether it's in Germany, in France, in Poland, in Spain for that matter, a country that has traditionally been quite accommodating of Russia, you're seeing a very firm, committed and united position against Russia. Yes, it's going to get difficult this winter, um, and we can talk more about that, but I believe that the brutality, the surprise, the shock of Russia's intervention uh, in Ukraine is going to make it very difficult uh, for European governments to step back and go uh, and relinquish their commitment um, to Ukraine. And I say that in particular based in London, where I think the British government is going to sustain its commitment. The NATO Madrid summit was very clear on these points as well. It has really upped its uh, security positioning, certainly vis-a-vis -vis Russia. But what does it mean about the Indo-Pacific? Obviously, one of the big concerns I would have if I was sitting uh, like many of you uh, in Taipei or if I were uh, in uh, Tokyo or in other parts of the Indo-Pacific, is how committed will Europeans be um, to, uh, to that region? Now, clearly, prior to Ukraine, there was a big move towards creating Indo-Pacific strategies, um, both by individual governments and by the EU as a whole. The EU tends to be more about thickening up economic and institutional uh, relationships, digital trade, broader trading relationships, maritime, uh, uh, soft security, I would say. What you're seeing uh, on the military side tends to be more bilateral. Uh, the UK with its carrier strike group uh, uh, deployment uh, around the Indo-Pacific last year, even Germany sending out a frigate. Um, it may seem little, but for Germany, it was a, it was a big move. The French in particular focused on India, uh, where they have a long history of, of exercises uh, and we've seen uh, the Brits as well uh, establish, in essence, the status of forces agreement recently with Japan uh, and doing joint exercises with the US. Again, I'd say the French being particularly notable uh, in their move. But we have to be frank, these are relatively modest steps, uh, the kind of freedom of navigation operations. They rely massively on the US uh, pivot. Uh, and I would say, and I'm interested to hear Jim Mattis's view on this, or Roy Metcalfs or others following me, um, that uh, uh, it does strike me that there is a pivot 2.0 taking place this time, where the pivot that was announced by President Obama as a European, it struck me that it never happened, and that in essence Beijing took over the South China Sea uh, under the Obama uh, presidency, sadly. 
Um, but this time, uh, I think we're seeing both from the Trump administration and now into the Biden administration, a much more serious commitment to the Indo-Pacific. My concluding remark, therefore, is that I think we see, and this is the most important thing at the element uh, at the moment, the emergence of what I call an Atlantic Pacific partnership, where in essence uh, we have seen remarkably Pacific powers, Japan, South Korea, even Singapore, supporting the U.S. and Europe against its invasion. Uh, 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 Russia's invasion of Ukraine, including for the first time imposing sanctions, and doing so partly to try to lock European powers and the US into long-term support against China's threats in the Indo-Pacific. But at the same time, European powers are realizing that they have to sustain meaningful Indo-Pacific strategies to counterbalance China. Otherwise, there's a risk of a weakening of US commitments to, to Europe uh, against Russia. So there is a coming together of both Indo-Pacific and transatlantic security uh, in a really interesting way uh, as a result of this growing Russia-China uh, alignment. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. That's fantastic. A lot of meat uh, in that contribution, and I'm sure a lot of it will be unpacked in the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes. I will now go to my Australian compatriot, Rory Medcalf. Uh, from the uh, ANU. Uh, that I can see you better over there, Rory. Um, I look forward to hearing your contribution. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. It's, gr it's great to see you. It's great to be on this panel. It's great to be part of this really important forum. And I would also uh, echo condolences uh, personally and institutionally uh, for uh, the, the tragic loss of um, of Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. Uh, look, I wanted to uh, really echo some of the messages that we've heard already. Uh, I'm in reasonably furious agreement with most of what has been said, but the, um, the thrust of my argument would be that there are indeed responses, not only lessons, uh, to go with the, um, the admonition from our chair. Let's look at the responses. There are strategic echoes in the Indo-Pacific of uh, the lessons of uh, Russia's aggression uh, in Ukraine, against Ukraine. And this is really a long game. We're seeing the beginning of uh, substantial change, but it's going to take a number of years to play out. Um, I have to confess that although I'm speaking from the Indo-Pacific and from an Australian perspective, I've actually recently spent quite some time in Europe, uh, particularly in dialogue with EU and NATO colleagues. And it is really striking that although Europe has a very grim situation on its hands, the, the wake-up call uh, that Russia, uh, that Putin has provided to Europe this year is, uh, in fact, I think in the long run, strengthening European determination regarding the global balance of power as well. So, again, I think this is deeply counterproductive as far as um, China's interests are concerned, or at least uh, Xi Jinping's interests are concerned, and very counterproductive to the idea of a China-Russia partnership. So, again, something of an own goal. What do I mean by that? Um, I think that whether or not we agree that there is a single strategic theatre, there are certainly echoes and lessons from the European and Indo-Pacific theatres for one another. And because so much of the contest for influence is occurring not only in the conventional military plane, but also in terms of geoeconomics, technology, disinformation, uh, national resilience, that there's actually plenty that European and Indo-Pacific partners can do to support one another, um, even apart from the realm of frontline military uh, military operations. And I do agree, for example, with Robin Niblett's point that the European contribution to security in the Indo-Pacific is not primarily going to come from frontline forces. But if, for example, you were to imagine a situation where uh, European powers are providing more for their own defence, NATO is significantly stronger, uh, where we see um, Germany, and I hope Japan as well, keeping to their new ambitions of higher levels of defence capabil capability, spending and preparedness. One thing we are doing here is actually creating more space for the United States to be that decisive actor in the Indo-Pacific that really we need it 
we need it to be. I think also one of the big lessons that is transferring already into policy responses from the Ukraine conflict and from Russia's invasion is the recognition in many of our countries that because aggression has not gone away, it is not a thing of the past, therefore there is stronger public support for strengthening national capability, defence capability, national security preparedness, we're seeing this in Australia, and fascinatingly, although we now have a centre-left government, uh, a new government in Australia, uh, a Labor government, which you would think is going to be, uh, if you like, less forthright on national security than the Conservative government that it replaces. In fact, we're seeing broad continuity, I think, in national security policy settings, and we're seeing almost a consensus across the mainstream of Australian politics and public opinion now for stronger defence capabilities for the AUKUS partnership, for example, for the Quad, for Australia uh, taking a firm stance against Chinese coercion. This would not have been the case uh, three, five, seven years ago. And I think it's not just a consequence of China's direct actions. It's also a consequence of the new strategic environment that Russia's outright aggression has, has demonstrated to us. I can't speak directly for other countries in the Indo-Pacific, but I think that uh, thinking in Japan would be broadly similar. Uh, I know the conversation from an Indian perspective is different, and we'll hear about that uh, shortly from our Indian colleague, but there is a new sense of a new grim sense of determination of protecting sovereignty among a wide range of nations and partners. And that is actually, I think, good for stability. It's good for the strategic balance in the Indo-Pacific. I would also note that um, the response to the Ukraine uh, crisis, the Ukraine uh, war, in geoeconomic terms, that is the use of national economic and technology capability for state leverage by democracies is a playbook we're only beginning to experiment with. And again, uh, lessons being drawn from uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine can become increasingly useful in the Indo-Pacific context. I would not be surprised if more and more players, particularly in Europe, begin to revisit the depth of their own economic dependence on China, precisely because of their desire to avoid a repeat of the situation where, if you like, you know, Russia effectively has attempted, unsuccessfully, but has attempted to hold their policy settings hostage through economic dependence. Um, just a couple of final points from me um, to allow a bit more time for our other speaker and discussion. The... Um, the example of resistance, um, of the role of, leader, of strong leadership, effective national leadership, charismatic and courageous national leadership, and the mobilisation of citizenry that we have seen in Ukraine, I think, holds lessons for democracies everywhere. Um, again, I can't speak for Taiwan in that regard, but I think the reminder that size isn't everything when it comes to uh, dealing with aggression is incredibly uh, important, uh, if you like, lesson, insight from the Ukraine uh, conflict. I don't think this means that uh, the calculations in Beijing about possible future aggression against Taiwan, I don't think it means that those calculations are permanently postponed, but I do think that uh, if, uh, if the Chinese leadership and the PLA has any sense, they will be uh, reconsidering a number of their options. They will be taking a very long and close study of uh, Russia's military failures in Ukraine and, and drawing lessons, and at the very least, this buys time, um, but it creates a window of opportunity that democratic allies have to leverage here in the Indo-Pacific. We certainly cannot be complacent about um, uh, about any of that. So, look, I think I'll leave it there. There's a lot more that, um, that I could say, uh, but we have time in the question and answer to go into that a little bit further. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. That's fantastic. Um, we're now going to hear from uh, Jayadeva Renade uh, from India who is the president of the Centre for China Analysis and Strategy. And uh, because everyone's being so excellent with their timing, uh, we'll have plenty of time left for questions and answers, which I'm very much looking forward to. Jayadeva, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Christopher. Uh, you can relax a little bit. I'm not going to take much time. I'll follow the footsteps of the other panelists and um, state a few points, which I think uh, would give you the Indian perspective of how we are looking at what's going on. Uh, firstly, at the outset, uh, let me say that uh, the uh, term responses uh, from the Indo-Pacific may be somewhat premature because uh, we are looking at what's happening in the Ukraine as still an unfolding event. Uh, and therefore, uh, responses will, are still being shaped. Uh, it will depend a lot on what the final outcomes are, obviously, or when they become apparent. Having said that, let me say that uh, what Putin has set in motion uh, with Ukraine, quite apart from the grab for territory, which of course is there, is, I think, an attempt to change the existing global world order. And uh, it's a muscular attempt. And in that, he is backed uh, fully by Xi Jinping. Uh, I think the summit meeting on the 4th of February was crucial. And let me just um, mention a couple of sentences from the joint statement, which I think indicate um, why and how China has been backing uh, Putin and Russia uh, unwaveringly till now. A um, couple of sentences, I said, uh, where they said, we firmly support each other's core interests and oppose external forces interfering in the internal affairs of the two countries and undermining the security and stability of the common surrounding areas of the two countries. In other words, each of them is justifying not only Putin's action, but also Chinese uh, action with India and uh, possibly in future elsewhere. Uh, it certainly uh, uh, echoes the statements by Chinese leaders regarding Taiwan and uh, India. The second is where they state that the two sides will uphold responsibility and morality and promote world multipolarization, democratization of international relations, and work together to build a new type of international relations. I think the last um, fits in with what I said about an attempt to change the global world order. They've, of course, expressed their apprehensions about color revolution and hegemony, uh, which they both have. Um, behind this uh, comment of mine is also the uh, assumption uh, shared by quite a few, I think, at least here, that uh, notwithstanding the color that they both have now, Russia and China, uh, they are essentially, uh, the leadership certainly, are still communist in nature. Uh, Putin and Xi Jinping are both, they share a lot of similarities. They're both um, autocrats. Uh, they're both steeped in the communist philosophy and ideology. Uh, Putin may have uh, jettisoned that in order for a more, uh, shall I say, a czarist kind of outlook. But Xi Jinping is in fact doubling down on the communist ideology uh, in China. And uh, they have uh, made no, uh, they've not shied away from expressing their support uh, for what Putin is doing despite the telephone calls between Biden and Xi Jinping. Uh, there is, I know, another call due in another few days. Uh, I frankly don't expect, I'll be happy, of course, if there is a change, but I don't expect a change in uh, China's um, attitude. Certainly not a public uh, change in their posture. And I think here the Global Times commentary, which uh, of March 18, which described the relationship as uh, China's most strategic asset, uh, is is uh, important. There have been, not in terms of response, but there has been an impact also of the uh, war in Ukraine on China's internal politics. And I think at this uh, delicate time, where Xi Jinping is uh, going in for the eight, uh, 20th Party Congress, um, he is sensitive or more sensitive to uh, what's happening, uh, the effects of that within the country. And uh, there is a clear uh, divergence of views within China, uh, one lot uh, favoring uh, severing of ties with Russia, um, wanting to come closer, uh, if not in pragmatic terms, but at least in, uh, uh, shall I say, stated terms to the West, 
and the other standing uh, with uh, Xi Jinping and pushing the line of uh, near alliance uh, with Russia. And I think um, what upsets or what worries Xi Jinping really and the core leadership around him is the fear that they may cross a red line as far as the West is concerned and that the US and or West may hit them with sanctions. That is a real worry considering that a large number, in fact, the majority of department heads and above of the Chinese Communist Party, their children are studying in the West and in the United States. They've got their money parked there and they've seen what has happened to people who've been sanctioned. Um, the children have had to come back and um, the money has been confiscated. The children coming back particularly affects them uh, since it's a one child policy and many of them have all their aspirations centered on that one uh, child. So I think that's uh, the other uh, uh, factor that uh, is there. But along with that, a couple of other worries he has is the progress of the war itself. It's gone on for well over 100 days. And I think that is not the way that Xi Jinping or the PLA envisage the war. Uh, their own philosophy is for a quick, short uh, action with overwhelming firepower and a victory at the end. Well, they haven't achieved that with us on the border. And uh, they're seeing that it's not uh, coming to pass in Ukraine. And I think that has unnerved them. Together with the recent uh, statement by NATO uh, about uh, China as a strategic uh, competitor or a threat and uh, talk about, and about the AUKUS being announced. I think these have uh, got the Chinese leadership worried about future and potential uh, uh, designs of the United States and the West. Um, it doesn't mean that they're going to change their uh, policy, uh, not now that uh, Xi Jinping has got them enshrined in the constitution about what he calls the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, uh, which of course impacts a number of countries in the Indo-Pacific, uh, Japan, India, uh, Taiwan, etc. A number of countries are affected. And here uh, I uh, must invite reference to the Chinese response to the statement out of Washington that uh, Nancy Pelosi may be visiting Taiwan and their threat to uh, uh, sort of see that the aircraft doesn't land. Uh, they left it vague enough so for us to figure out what it means. But they've uh, uh, come out with this, uh, putting, I would say, the United States in a bit of a predicament. Uh, maybe predicament is a strong term, but uh, if the United States doesn't go ahead with the visit or if Nancy Pelosi doesn't go ahead with the visit, for whatever may be the reason, even if she falls ill or whatever, it will be uh, interpreted by China as the United States having backed down and it will be portrayed as such. If she does go ahead, uh, my own hunch is that uh, they'll be calling uh, Xi Jinping's bluff and, um, uh, you know, he's not going to be able to do anything. Because if he does try and physically prevent the aircraft from landing, it will mean uh, a conflagration, if not a confrontation. So um, that is how we look at it. Um, and um, uh, final couple of points. Uh, while uh, we are noting what the U.S. is doing, what the West is doing, the, the U.S. and us, we have very close ties. In fact, uh, they've... Uh, uh, been boosted with the Chinese uh, incursion. But um, we are also noting the reluctance of the multinationals and the big businesses to pull out of China. And that, I think, is a weak point because the Chinese will use it to uh, try and keep some kind of a relationship going. And here, I think I should mention that unlike Russia, China is far more interconnected with the global markets and with the global financial system. And even psychologically, if you talk to the Chinese people today, they do feel a bit isolated because they say we don't have the friends that we used to. And if they see um, prominent, um, shall I say, uh, you know, landmark uh, signs like of KFC, etc., pulling out, it'll be a psychological blow to them uh, too. So I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here. But I will say that um, I don't expect Xi Jinping to change his policies. He has shown no signs of that. He will continue to try and sit on the edge, as it were. But uh, 
uh, you know, the factor, uh, the the points here are that uh, he cannot afford to lose space at this particular time. So if he's pushed to a corner, um, he will be in a predicament. He will have to make a choice. And uh, he might even end up facing the ire of the Chinese people who have been hyped by him uh, onto ultranationalism. So I'll stop here. And I'm open for questions, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Jai Deva. And uh, uh, they were all five excellent contributions. Uh, we've, we've already received a couple of quite specific questions about cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, which I'd like to get to. But I'd like to start with a, a general question. And I'd like to, to lead off with, um, with Jim Mattis being given the opportunity to answer it. And that is a lot of the speakers have referred to the February meeting between Putin and Xi Jinping. Uh, obviously before the invasion of the Ukraine began. And I'm interested in what the speaker's view is about the calculation that China will now be making out of the four factors which I think have surprised everyone. One has been the apparent military weakness of Russia, which wasn't predicted. I think the second is the much more uh, unified response from NATO. Uh, the third is the cohesive and well-established uh, and put into place and policed sanctions of most of the Western world and uh, people beyond uh, the Western world, which I think have been some of the most effective sanctions we've seen in a very long time. And fourthly, the better than expected, with great respect, performance of the Biden administration in responding to the war in Ukraine and in unifying NATO, the sanctions regime, to actually have a significant impact on the war. All those factors, I think, were different to what China and Russia would have been discussing on February the 4th. And I'd be interested to know, starting with you, Jim, how you think that will impact on China's calculations in terms of the Indo-Pacific and obviously Taiwan in particular. Yeah, thank you. I, I, these have been excellent comments. Uh, what struck me uh, listening to the various speakers is the degree of common assessment of the problem we face, which is the attack on the international order and very specifically on nation sovereignty. I think that uh, it has been sobering to President Xi, who believes, like President Putin, that the democracies are, are weakening, they're on their way out, they can't govern uh, the normal raucous uh, kind of political affairs that go on in democracies are seen as weaknesses by them. Uh, and I think to suddenly find there's, there's life in the democracies, there's unity, uh, there's actually the willingness to take very strong steps, like you said, the strongest economic steps, uh, probably since back in the World War I days, uh, is what we're observing right now. So as we look at this, uh, what has also struck me that they have to consider is not just if there's weak executive leadership in in this Western capital or that Western capital, but look at the role of Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg, uh, the uh, brilliant uh, NATO Secretary General, and President Ursula von der Leyen uh, of the European Commission, who between them had recognized the threat and had essential missions basically ready to go in terms of military actions, uh, and in terms of economic sanctions. This has got to play in President Xi's consideration because if Russia, which shares a, uh, shares a long land border and can mass its army literally on the border within meters of the, uh, of the country it's going to attack, if they have run into this much problem, and any military amateur even can tell you that an amphibious operation is the single most dicey, most risky military operation of any kind. And that is 130 kilometers of very bad water between the mainland and Taiwan. 
the legitimacy of President Xi, which has been mentioned by several here, uh, in the event this went wrong, uh, the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party, all of that would be uh, up for grabs at that point. I think that China is, uh, you're quite right, uh, they do think it will be a swift fight. Uh, that is always a recipe for disaster when you calculate you can do something swiftly in military terms. So the longer it went on, the more effectively that the uh, Taiwan leadership and military and the civilian populace resisted uh, would create more opportunity again for the democracies. They're slower moving at times than an, than an autocrat. They have to bring their people with them. But I think that uh, this would be a, uh, a sobering uh, reminder to President Xi that his entire officer corps, never having been in a war before, they might want to be a little slow to embark on something this risky based on what they've seen happen uh, with a much simpler operational problem like Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Back over to you. Uh, back over to you, Christopher. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Yasahida, would you like to comment on that uh, question? Thank you very much. Uh, think about the uh, 20th century Cold War. Soviet Union and the United States of America against each other. And it, it was uh, quite a long time against each other. And uh, one day, the Berlin Wall has collapsed and uh, Cold War no more exist. But uh, we, the Japanese, especially me, I thought the Cold War is not to disappear. Cold War is going to in, in, in a deep under the basement. And suddenly, 21st century now, it appears as a, against liberal democratic and autocrats. So the 21st century of Cold War is against autocrats versus Democrat, Democrats. That is, that is a fact. And uh, if you, from the point of view of Japan or Taiwan, every single day, every single day, China, PLA, Chinese PLA, and Russia military, they are collaborating, not just start from Beijing Olympic Games. They started like uh, 2010, or even before, they are making artificial island inside of the uh, South China Sea. And how about the East China Sea? They are digging the resources. They never make promises. I mean, they make promise, but suddenly they broke the, break the promise. This is uh, their habit. So we have to think more straight, and we, have, we never give them. Uh, how do you say that? Uh, we never forgive them. Uh, promise. If you made a promise, you have to keep the promise. And uh, so I, I can say that uh, we, we gathered here, and all the thinkers and participants knew it, what's happening the next. So please imagine, after 1997, Hong Kong and Macau going back to China, communist China, and finally Xi Jinping lied. Uh, they, he, he said, he mentioned, he, they are going to do one state, two solutions, but they ignore. They lied, one state and one solution only. So they grabbed the Hong Kong, Macau, and every single issue, and now, they try to challenge the Taiwan Strait. So how do the West countries going to react? But we don't like war. We never like a conflict. So how is going to be managed? And one more thing. I was born in 1970, so I'm going to become 52 this year. And since I was looking from the child, who is the world number one country? The, uh, I thought United States of America is the number one in a militaristic way, a freedom of democracy. Everything is 
my love country. I, I mean, the Japanese loves the United States of America. Even we fought against each other in World War II. But when the Obama administration, the President Obama said, we are not, gonna go, not, not going anymore as a police of the world. After that, what's happening in the Middle East? The Daesh, IS, ISIL expansion is really uh, rapidly increased at that time. And also the, uh, uh, how do you say, the Assad regime is also increased rapidly. And Russia is going to, you know, try more challenges to the Middle East at that time. So I never forget that kind of uh, uh, word. I hope the United States, in, in this moment, when the Obama administration, in he, when he was the president, the, who, is, who was the vice president at that time? Vice president was Joe Biden. Now he became a president of the United States of America. So I hope that Mr. President Joe Biden has to be more, show more strong leadership and protect and defending the allies of democracy, democratic nations. Uh, I hope he will make a very strong team. Without uh, making a team, we cannot, uh, how do you say, uh, against or manage China-Russia collaboration. If you look at the cyberspace, if you look at the outer space, the satellite, if the China and Russia collaborate, the numbers of the satellite is more than the United States has. So we have to be careful uh, those kind of a new hybrid warfare, and also we have to prepare for every dimension collaborating with North Korea, China, Russia. NATO country is a multiple country who against only one country called Russia. We, the Japan, is the only one country against three terrible countries, Russia, North Korea, China. And all countries have a nuclear weapon. So how should we manage? We have to show the deterrence. Deterrence is needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Robin Noblet, did you have a comment? Just a very quick one. Uh, I think uh, Jim Mattis was absolutely right that um, the Chinese leadership will have watched what's happened in Ukraine with shock, disappointment. My conclusion, nonetheless, is that uh, Beijing, Xi Jinping will not abandon Putin, will not abandon Russia. If anything, they almost have to double down. Um, two reasons. One, prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, China was already in Europe's and America's crosshairs uh, with sanctions imposed over Xinjiang, over Hong Kong, over the increasing centralization um, and more autocratic style of this particular Communist Party uh, leadership. Um, so looking to the long term, if you're sitting in Beijing, the capacity for a truly deeply integrated relationship, in particular with Western markets, was starting to look shaky prior to the invasion of Ukraine. Ultimately, today, if you do believe the world order, and I agree with the analysis we've all made here from Beijing's standpoint, if that world order looks uh, threatening to you, actually a weaker Russia would mean a weaker China. You do not, if you're Beijing, want to be left alone to face uh, the democratic uh, governments around the world without China. And I see China and Russia back to back since Ukraine, both metaphorically and uh, geographically. They will increase their economic interdependencies. Uh, Russia, to state the obvious, is a huge supplier uh, of the raw materials for China's uh, future economic growth, in particular in more sustainable forms of energy uh, development. And we know that the, the grand aim is to push, uh, Roy Mekar probably knows more about this than I do, but will push for dual circulation, as it's called, for greater reliance internally on the Chinese market, much as the Americans are able to be much more reliant on their own market. But the bit we've left out is that both Russia and China believe they are winning the debate with the 140 plus countries that are not imposing sanctions on Russia for Ukraine, who are open to the narrative that this is, as Nakayama said, uh, you know, a sort of Cold War 2.0. 
um, who, who see the sanctions as much as Russia's invasion as affecting them. And uh, in a way, what China can do in particular is focus on those other countries and try to make sure that they uh, develop much more economic, uh, closer economic relationships with them over time. And the one place I'm afraid I would disagree with nakayama san is this will not then be autocracies versus democracies. It will be the liberal democracies, uh, of which Britain and all the countries on this uh, panel are, are part, against two autocracies, principally, Russia and China, and a very small band of allies, Iran, North Korea, I don't know, you know Nicaragua, Venezuela, but it's a small group. But we are going to be competing for the support of other autocracies, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Vietnam, take your pick, or even governments that are maybe pushing democracy in the wrong direction. Um, so it's going to become a very contested world, which will look more like, I'm afraid, Cold War 1.0, where uh, depend on which side you were on the battle, whether you were the ally or not, not always on the system of your government. Um, in any case, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And uh, Rory Medcalf. Look, just briefly, and I just to pick up on um, Robin's point about the, the battle for the middle ground, uh, I think that all of our democracies need to step up the argument that really what uh, Putin is embarked on here is, is, is imperialism. It's, it, it's a, uh, if you like, it's an attempt to reconquer uh, territory that um, you could argue is, was part of an empire. Uh, it's got to be a message that resonates, particularly with developing countries, with countries that themselves have been uh, colonised over the years. Uh, and that's the battle that we're probably not winning at the moment in places like Africa. So I think the counter disinformation is an absolutely vital global mission. But on the, um, if you like, the material realities of what this has done for Russia's, Russia and China's relative power in the world, I, I, I agree that, in fact, uh, this is likely to end with Russia as a weaker and um, more risk-prone partner for China. It's not the partner that China was hoping for or expecting. Um, I agree that Xi Jinping's on something of a, a path-dependent force here. It's going to be hard for him to back down. But along with the, um, you know, the, I think, the COVID zero policy, which is uh, a rigid policy that, that cannot succeed, I, I think he's, he's pushing himself into some pretty dangerous corners here for China's interests in the long term. And that's, again, why uh, liberal democracies have to, if you like, retain confidence in their own narratives and work with others, and I'd actually mention here uh, India, Indonesia, a number of other countries which, for their own reasons, understandably have had partnership relationships with Russia in the past, to work with them to revisit the question of can Russia really be a reliable partner in the long run when it's going to be increasingly beholden to China as the more powerful of the pair. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. Jayadeva. Uh, thank you. I'll just uh, uh, pick up on a point uh, that uh, Rory Metcalf made about uh, the reliability of Russia as far as India and Russia are concerned. Uh, those doubts are already there, and um, we are looking very hard uh, to see, um, you know, what we should be doing next. We are certainly, uh, shall I say, very uncomfortable with the idea that Russia and China are getting even closer. And uh, if the sanctions start biting uh, Russia to the extent that uh, we understand they are, and their capacity to produce military hardware gets uh, affected, uh, then, of course, there will again have to be radical changes. The other point I'd like to make is, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, competing or the democracies competing uh, with a large number of countries, I think um, uh, Mr. Nablet talked about 140 other countries. Uh, I think I'd put it slightly differently, which is that depending on the kind of actions that the democracies take against China and uh, Russia, um, they will move in that direction. They're waiting to see um, how, how much damage or how much pain uh, China will be put to and how much, uh, how Russia is going to fare. I think it appears by and large that Russia is going to become 
uh, virtually a vassal state of the Chinese. Uh, there are various scenarios that the Chinese are talking about, that Putin being overthrown or uh, an, a pro-American uh, uh, government taking over in Russia, etc. Uh, all of them are extremely worrying, not only for Xi Jinping, but for China. They don't want to be the only communist state facing uh, the West and uh, the United States. So I think that is a worry. But the rest of the countries are waiting to see what happens, uh, how firm and how strong the uh, de democracies are against these countries. And I think that's going to be the tipping point, really. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I have a specific question to Jim Mattis. Uh, while we have the opportunity to ask the former Secretary of Defence a very specific question, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor, uh, and so please be prepared to ask some questions while you've got the chance. Uh, Jim, this morning, the Taiwan Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs, Tian Chung Wang, uh, mentioned uh, that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Taiwan is considering synergizing Taiwan's New Southbound policy with US Indo-Pacific strategy. First question is, would coastal security cooperation be a practical and feasible starting point for that cooperation? And secondly, uh, taking into account the offensive cyber operations carried out during the Ukraine war, NATO's Cooperative Cyber Defence Centre of Excellence has been sharing intelligence with Ukraine's IT army on several major international international events through the 1.5 track mechanism. Is this intelligence sharing model in the Ukraine applicable to the Indo-Pacific region? Uh, excellent questions. I think on the way to look at this is cooperation cannot be limited in a situation like this. In other words, we have to decide what will we stand for, and just as importantly, what will we not stand for? And if we are going to see a nation putting its young men on the front lines fighting to maintain the concept of sovereign nations have a right to make up their own direction, then we're going to have to stand up for sovereignty. What does that mean? It's not just about democracy. Uh, certainly, as, uh, as, as Robin said, there's a lot of other nations out there that we're going to have to win over. And if a nation is reflecting, I would call it a, a just or responsive government is, is trying to guide them, uh, and we can help them with information, we can help them with cyber, then we should be helping them. And the fact that we don't necessarily agree with their internal politics does not mean we cannot find common ground when it comes to defense of sovereignty. Whether And Vietnam may have a kind of government that Americans will never agree with. That doesn't mean we don't want a free and independent Vietnam. Uh, that, that is a given. So I think, yes, we can find a way where the example of sharing of information and more uh, can, can apply to the Indo-Pacific. I believe India is in much more danger as a frontline state based on what we're seeing going on. And I think uh, the more we can help India, uh, the, the, the better off we are. And that goes all the way, echoes all the way through the Indo-Pacific right now. And some nations are not at the same point as we are, having tried 40 years with Republican and Democrat administrations to embrace India as a responsible stakeholder, uh, as one that shows respect for other nations. We have tried it. Uh, it. We have been forced into a position that we can see reflected by Sweden and Finland. They didn't want to do this joining NATO. They have been forced into it by the increasing aggressiveness of the uh, authoritarians. That means we are going to have to open the door to cooperation with nations that prize their independence, their sovereignty, democracy. In some cases, it won't be a democracy, maybe not yet, but we're going to have to find ways to do it. I hope that addresses your question, Chris. Thank you very much, Jim. And, uh... The Prospect Foundation runs this uh, 
this uh, Congress as, as well and as efficiently as the Taiwanese government runs Taiwan. And as a consequence, I'm being given the, the round up, the wrap up, so there won't be any questions from the floor. But I would ask you to join me in thanking Jim Mattis, Yasuhuda Nakayama, uh, Robin Niblett, uh, Jayadeva Ranadi, and Rory Medcalf uh, for their excellent contributions this afternoon. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thanks to thank you very much, Thor, Christopher Pine, for uh, for moderating this panel.